Welcome everybody to the latest episode of Social Europe podcast. Today we continue our investigation into the digital revolution and what likely impacts it will have on the world of work. I'm very glad that I'm joined today by Richard Freeman, who holds the Herbert Asherman Chair in Economics at Harvard University, and he's currently also serving as faculty co-director of the Labor and Work Life Program at the Harvard Law School. He's also, furthermore, a senior research fellow in labor markets at the London School of Economics. We would like to thank the Hans Böckler Stiftung for their generous support for this project looking into the digital revolution and its likely impact on labor markets. Great. So, uh, Richard, thank you very much for uh, joining us today to discuss the digital revolution as a shorthand for technological change in general and what kind of impact it has on the world of work. Let's start with a more general question. Um, what do you think uh, is the impact of these technological changes on the world of work? Well, I think that the development of artificial intelligence and uh, more, call it, flexible robots uh, is indeed creating uh, machines that are better substitutes for some of the uh, more skilled things that humans have done. Traditionally, machines could do good things uh, in sort of muscle activities. They can now do things in uh, uh, more subtle activities, uh, including outthinking us at various times. And that is clearly changing the, the world of work. Okay. And on the discussion about, you know, substitution of jobs, the creation of new jobs and augmentation of jobs in the sense that, you know, that the profile of, of jobs will change completely. Uh, where do you stand? Are you one of the pessimists who think that there is a, an overwhelming case for the likelihood of substitution more than job creation and augmentation? Or do you think there will be a balance as in previous in, uh, technical um, jumps forward? Well, I would consider myself an optimist, but it's optimist in the sense that if we manage this process well, uh, it should improve living standards for people and create possibilities for greater leisure if we want it. The, uh, the traditional, though, optimist view is uh, humans would always be able to get uh, better jobs be because the machines were substituting for brawn. So they substitute for brains. It doesn't mean we, we, we necessarily lose work, but it does mean that there's going to be a bound on the wages in many occupations that people get. If there's a machine that can do an accounting job as well as an accountant, the accountant's wage is going to be less than or equal to that of the uh, machine. And so I think the key thing is whether we citizens of the different countries own the machines and have a stake in, in the income that's going to flow from our substitutes or, or not. If we have a, a good share of the income that will come from these Uh, machines, then I think we're all going to be better off. If we don't, it's not going to be that people will lack jobs, but people's incomes just simply will, will stagnate or go down um, as the machines provide low-cost substitutes for the best things we can do. And we'll come to the citizen share in, in a moment, but when we stay with the labor market or the likely shape of the future labor market for a moment, um, do you agree with other people we've talked to, and uh, also that seems to be the evidence that I um, cited in my own work on the subject, is that the shape of the labor market at least tends to be uh, going towards a polarization. So um, if you don't change the ownership share of this capital or the, the capitalist robots and, um, and these sort of things, you will see a polarization in the sense that a few people will reap the digitization dividend and move to the top. But a lot of middle class jobs, what are now perceived as middle class jobs, um, are prone to substitutions and might be transformed into uh, a rather low-skill, lower-paying service sector jobs, uh, a trend that we've seen also uh, in recent years. Would you broadly agree with this characterization, or do you see it differently? 
No, no, I do agree with that uh, characterization. I can imagine there are very uh, sophisticated machines, and our job is perhaps to make sure the machines are are clean and their plugs they're plugged into the electricity. <laughs> So you you agree with this trend? So basically, we'll we will we are potentially faced with the hollowing out of what used to be perceived as middle class jobs. Well, we see that occurring already, and and the certainly the uh, robotics and and other m more sophisticated machines are still you know many are still in the pipeline. So yes, I think this is not a um, what's the right word? Not pessimistic. Uh, view or optimistic view, but a uh, a realistic view. Okay, and if you move on to the potential remedies, uh, you have suggested a a citizen share. Can you just briefly explain uh, what you mean by this? Well, if we we have machines that are very good substitutes for us, and that are increasing productivity, uh, you know, around the world, which these machines will. will are and will keep doing, then the, the key issue is not what the machines that, that does for the world of work, but who owns the machines and gets the benefits of the improved technology. Uh, so my solution, I think the only reasonable solution, in a, particularly in a capitalist uh, system, is that ownership uh, be extended to more and more people. We cannot, I think, uh, we do not want, certainly, a world in which a small number of uh, medieval-style lords uh, own all the capital and the rest of us are serfs uh, working on their uh, plantations or whatever. And that would be capital ownership by the workers, or could it be also public ownership by governments and state institutions? I am actually favor for ownership by workers. Uh, maybe this is uh, a very American view, but um, I'm suspicious of governments owning. We've had experience with governments trying to own things, you say under the communists and, and so on. And, we, and that has not worked out well. It's better that it be decentralized ownership. And, you know, basic economics is also very much favorable to more decentralized ownership. Big government owns something, it makes a mistake, it can be terrible. I own something and I make a mistake, it may be bad for me, but it doesn't uh, harm uh, other people who are making better ownership decisions. So I'm for people owning, uh, not for the state Uh, owning obviously there are functions for the state, you know, public parks and infrastructure investments that states should do. But the idea that government would step in and uh, either own things or redistribute income through huge taxes strikes me as very dangerous. I mean, uh, what I'm referring to is a discussion that we actually had on, on Social Europe uh, when we looked at inequality. There was a proposal, for instance, that if you take as given uh, the structural primary distribution that Thomas Piketty described, um, even with very, very high marginal tax rates, you will not be able to um, solve the distributional puzzle. And what was proposed by an Italian economist who teaches in Berlin uh, was what he called public capital in the 21st century. Basically, uh, this is a sovereign wealth fund uh, that takes uh, capital positions in a diversified portfolio and basically reaps the return on this capital. It's not the idea that we have old-fashioned sort of statism in the sense that, you know, you own and run uh, businesses yourself, but it's basically the, the state being, in a sense, a, a, an investor and being part of, you know, having, having the return on this capital re-socialized. Uh, okay, there, there's some sense to that, and it's probably sovereign wealth funds – Uh, should be part of the solution because we currently have pension funds. They're not state, mm -hmm. but they are certainly state privileged uh, through tax benefits you have in, in pension monies. And there are many of them. And I suppose I'm preferable to, if we're going to have large pension funds, which I, I assume we, we, that will be part of a solution, 
um, or sovereign funds, there should be many of those funds rather than a single such fund. The Norwegians have been remarkably successful, I think, with their sovereign wealth fund. The state of Alaska has done reasonably well, just declaring you know dividends for paying paying money to every citizen. So so there are there are successes, but there's also these great dangers when you get politicians and uh, involved in, in with huge sums of money without enough controls. The potential for uh, uh, chicanery, for bad behavior, for taking care of my family and friends, um, et cetera, seems to me high. So if if the root and if this Italian economist uh, working in Berlin uh, proposed sovereign wealth funds that are uh, broken up into competitive funds, that, that seems to me a, a, a correct and probably a necessary part of, of the solution. What that doesn't do, though, is, is give incentives to the people at a company to work harder or better. To, to a person at a company, it's still some outside investor owns the firm, and I'm working for the outside investor. The virtue of having workers uh, have a stake in their own company is I think that incentivizes a greater productivity and effort as well. So I, I think in net, I'm in favor of a mixture of these uh, schemes. Okay, so on the public side, it really depends on how this is set up and how the checks and balances work. But at the same time, uh, because, you know, if you have individual uh, shares, you create an additional incentive in the workplace. So basically, a good solution could be a well-balanced mixture of both. Yes, I, I think actually if you, do, if you look at the actual numbers, um, certainly for the U.S., it, it, I, I know it, it would have to be a mixture Although I'm thinking not of a government uh, sovereign wealth fund, because we we've got the tax privileged pension funds, which you know are very similar, and they they own large amounts of uh, of companies, um, and have tended to to be reasonably uh, they've worked out reasonably well, I think. Okay, and uh, if we if we move on uh, just a bit from the labor market, market towards the the general shape of the economy, um, early indications might suggest we are seeing a, a big diversification of how the economy works. I mean, for instance, the traditional economic distinction between um, leisure and and work seems to be breaking down with the advent of new business models such as peer to peer um, and so on and so forth. So um, what? In, as a result of the discussions we've had on this issue so far, it, it seems uh, that the future economy might look a bit like this. You will have a traditional work sector um, propped up in one way or the other, but because of the uh, substitution effect that we've already talked about, there might be less work. So we're basically back to a Keynesian situation where uh, we will have to think about the reallocation of the remaining uh, paid work, and uh, that might lead to fewer hours. Then we'll have uh, a new sector, the sort of peer economy um, or an economy where basically value is created without actually money changing hands. So that will be uh, set in the middle somewhere. And then at the same time, we have, uh, in order to maintain domestic demand, and as you said, uh, distribution questions, we will have to make sure that capital ownership is, is looked at uh, uh, in different ways as well on top of uh, this. So um, what do you make of this kind of uh, interplay between different, different aspects of uh, a new economy? Well, there's one part of this uh, interplay in new economy that I think is uh, very bad that you, you've left off in your, your discussion of it. And this is this uh, uh, zero time work contracts, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, is remarkable, uh, turning workers into the most variable, <laughs> uncertain and risky positions. <laughs> Uh, um, obviously, if they all own large shares and have income, they can decide when you call me up, I can show up or I say, no, 
I'm I'm going to go to the beach today or I'm going to the park. But most of these workers are uh, are at risk. They need the money and uh, they have absolutely no certainty. And the employer is clearly not going to be investing in their skills. Um, so I, I think one has to monitor and probably with strong labor laws or employment laws, uh, how these uh, new forms of work arrangements uh, are undertaken. It is so easy if you're a freelance worker for you to have a, even when you have a contract to produce some work for your employer to say, oh, I really don't like it. I'll give you, um, you know, a thousand pounds or a thousand euros instead of the 1500 I, I had told you. And so it's, we, we have to make sure the contracts in this new more, I don't know, you could call it flexible, open exchanges are indeed, uh, uh, you know, the law, the law makes sure people carry out their contractual agreements. Mm-hmm. So within the uh, what we now still call the traditional labor market, there are uh, significant changes as a result of technology as well. So and, and you basically say we'll have to sort of regulate that in a new way. Also, for instance, um, these market making platforms need to be regulated so that labor legislation, such as minimum wages, um, safety and um, health regulations are actually enforced. And that might probably also lead to rethinking uh, completely the role of trade unions, because uh, they will have to find ways to organize these people. Yes. Yeah, so on this uh, Labor Day in the U.S., uh, one of the uh, things I think everybody, including the uh, many people inside the trade unions, understand is that they really have to change dramatically. But unfortunately, it's an old bureaucratic institution that has big troubles in making uh, tremendous changes. And it, it, I thought a lot about this and suggested various ways to the unions that they could change. Some of them are, but it's, it's, it's just a very hard process uh, for, 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 for the unions to, to shift to a, to a new world. But there's probably very little alternative for them. Well, well, there is incentive if they expect to have m- members in the future and, be- and uh, in, you know, become a, a an important force. In the U.S., they are a very marginal uh, a force because their membership declined. They are unable to to uh, to exploit or make use of the new technologies as well as firms do, and it's it's a real problem in our country. Um, I think in in Britain and some of the European countries, they've done a bit better. But I I, I think everybody, all the unions face this this giant challenge. You cannot be an organization uh, with, let's say, a tradition and a history and a mode of operating that worked 100 years ago or 70 years ago. Um, in a modern world with the internet and and with these machines that are going to be good substitutes for workers, you 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 have to adopt new new strategies, etc. Younger union people understand this, I think, better than some of the older leaders who built up their skills and their knowledge of the world and their connections um, from a different universe. Right, so we're having the well, the, the dilemma that given the revolutions on the labor market, we probably need unions more than ever before, but at the same time, they're, they're struggling tremendously to adapt to the new circumstances. Yes, and, I, and I, I think how we end up at the end will depend in part on whether unions are able to reinvent themselves or re, re, rejuvenate their their modes of operating and join the modern world instead of, uh, I say, living in in a past that is, is the past. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, Richard, towards the end, uh, I, I would like to put the very easy question to you. 
that if you were a policymaker today, uh, what would be your top three priorities? What kind of policy change would you enact in order to prepare um, for the challenges ahead? Oh, this sounds like the, one of the questions they ask Mr. Trump. Here's an easy one. <laughs> But uh, the, the, the first policy... I wouldn't want to ask him this question, though. <laughs> well, who knows what he would say. Um, I, I, I think the first policy change that I would... I strongly favor, and I've done some, some uh, let's say, serious policy analysis of, is... Uh, Uh, in encouraging uh, firms and workers to be uh, to have greater ownership stake going to workers, be that profit sharing inside companies, uh, or or I prefer some stock ownership inside companies, and that's number one. Um, number two, and this gets to your sovereign wealth fund kind of phenomenon, but I'm thinking about it as pension funds. What there's been very little movement here, but there's got to be a way in which these uh, pension funds and sovereign wealth funds that the people, the, the the voters or the members of the fund, have a bigger say in in how the funds invest their monies. It cannot rely on the Wall Street uh, experts to do that. That that created uh, uh, you know, that helped create the 2000. 7-2008 disaster, and you, you, need, you need individuals, uh, the, the real owners of the money, to have a bigger stake. So somehow they're democratizing the, uh, uh, the, uh, the ownership uh, or the control of these, of these funds. And then the third policy, I think, is, is to do some strengthening of traditional labor law things so we do not have more and more workers going in the, in your polarized world becoming uh, completely variable factors, their employment and wages dependent uh, upon uh, the, you know, the, the, the employers. Obviously, many employers will treat workers well, pay them well, but there's always going to be a, a fringe that will try to who, rip off the workers. And if they make more money, that fringe will grow. And so I think we do need some 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 labor uh, uh, laws restricting the zero, the zero time contract type phenomenons, and making sure that when there is a contract, it is in fact obeyed by the employer. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Richard, for taking the time to uh, speak to me today. And uh, I've got the hunch that this topic is not going to go away anytime soon. So this might only be the start of, uh, of a longer process. Uh, oh, I hope it is, because otherwise we're headed in this direction of uh, a small elite of super wealthy people controlling the capital, ultimately in the U.S. at least, controlling the politics And that, that's going to end in some sort of a very bad situation for everybody. Well, let's hope this uh, dystopia doesn't come about. So thank you very much again and uh, happy Labor Day. Okay, thank you. You've just listened to an episode of Social Europe Podcast. If you don't want to miss future episodes, please subscribe on iTunes or on Stitcher. Thank you very much.